Hello everyone in Studio 3. Here I am again in, <laughs> via the TV this time and I'd like to welcome Marlene Kreitz and I'm not going to say anything about Marlene, I'm not going to take any more of her time because I'm sure she can introduce herself. And here's the floor for you Marlene, I'll see you at the end. Great, thanks Kat. I'm clicking on share screen now, correct? Perfect, go ahead. Is that working? It is working. I hope it's working for everyone backstage and um, in Studio 3. If it's not, then we'll get told in the chat. Okay. okay. Good luck. Thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Marlene Kreitz. I'm speaking to you from Uktahungook, which is the Mi'kmaq name for the island now known as Newfoundland. It's the name in the upper left-hand corner, starting with the letter K. The rest of the map indicates traditional Mi'kmaq place names. The provincial territory of Newfoundland and Labrador has been inhabited by various indigenous groups for over 8,000 years. The island of Newfoundland, which you see here, is the closest point in North America to Europe. So European explorers arrived on this island before they arrived on the continent itself. The first Europeans to arrive here were the Norse around the year 1000. I live here at the edge of a town called Portugal Cove, which is just outside St. John's, the capital city of the province. Since 2002, I've been living and working in a six acre patch of boreal forest Traver traversed by the Blast Hole Pond River. It's officially called a river, but I would call it a stream. So this is Blast Hole Pond. Um, and it's officially called a pond, but it's really a large lake. And despite its name, it's not a quarry. There was no blasting involved in the creation of this lake unless you want to count volcanoes about 700 million years ago. Blast Hole Pond River flows down here. This is the roof of my house right here, and it continues on and flows into Conception Bay out there. I've been living in this house for the past 20 years, surrounded by the boreal forest, which has become my studio. And the window here is the window behind me. This is a little waterfall in the Blast Hole Pond River, a few hundred yards behind my house. The first project I did when I moved here is titled, Water Flowing to the Sea, Captured at the Speed of Light. Blast Hole Pond River, Newfoundland, 2002 to 2003. I started by simply taking these kinds of documentary photographs of the waterfall. Then one day I suddenly had a thought, what if the other looks back at the photographer? In other words, what if I reversed my position and became the one observed rather than the observer? So I began to take photographs with an underwater camera that I held under the flowing stream and turned towards myself. These aren't reflections in the surface of the water. If they were, you'd see the camera. The camera is actually under the water, aimed up at me as I'm standing in the plunge, plunge pool at the bottom of the waterfall. The water moving directly over the camera lens blurs and distorts my image, at times even obscures it completely. So the day I photographed the waterfall, I stood in the river and had it photograph me. There are four pairs, one for each season. This is the pair from the winter. I think this work relates very closely to the notions of materiality and transience. Certainly there's the transience of the seasons and the flowing water but also my own temporality, even in the place 
where I dwell. I sense quite strongly that I'm a transient figure, both when I'm a traveler and when I'm a dweller. This is the pair from the spring. I did this project 20 years ago. I like to point out that this was before selfies. There actually was a time before selfies. It was even before I had a digital camera. I used an underwater film camera and I didn't know the results until the films were developed. This is the pair from the summer. What interests me is the interplay and reciprocity between people and places. I wonder, what is a place to me and what am I to a place? Here's an installation view of the whole work, the four seasons. So 10 years later, I did this work to mark a decade passing. Instead of repeating what I'd done, I tried something different, working at night under a full moon, but this time the camera was not under the water. I often, I often find that the opposite of something is just as interesting as the original idea. This is the photograph on the left. It's the full moon reflected in the Blast Hole Pond River, just above the brink of the little waterfall. I calculated the time and taste the trajectory that the light took to register as photographs, which became the title. About eight and a half minutes from the sun to the moon, to the river, to my face, to the camera. The source of the light to create these photographs was the sun. So this project is about the essence of photography, which is light. Now, I have a short little poem called Skinny Dipping. I'm meeting the Blast Hole Pond River with all of my senses. But touch trumps them all when a trout bumps into my side. My greatest aspirations as an artist are presently constituted by this one place, this one patch of boreal forest and the Blast Hole Pond River. I've been slowly tuning my body and my reflexes to its details. I'm coming to know this habitat by engaging with it in various ways, such as corporally, emotionally, intellectually, instinctively, linguistically, and in astonishment. These black and white photographs are from an ongoing project that I started in 2007 titled Larch Spruce Fir Birch Hand. It's a series of photographs about some of the trees around me in the watershed of the river. These are trees that I've individuated I'm interested in the particularity of each tree and the circumstances that bring me to differentiate certain trees amongst the thousands in this particular patch of boreal forest. Touching the different textures of bark is an inherent part of my gesture and my way of greeting each tree. When I first moved here, the forest was an indistinct assortment of vegetation until I started spending time and becoming familiar with it. As I say, I'm getting to know this place, one stone, one wildflower, and one tree at a time. Even when I'm being my most attentive, there are still many trees I have not yet noticed enough to remember as individuals. Between 2007 and 2015, I continued the series of photographs with about nine trees that came to my attention each year. But what I should say is my attention 
came to them. This is an installation view of 18 excerpts from the 81 trees on which I photographed my hand between 2007 and 2015. In 2018, I started re-photographing my hand on the same trees I had photographed in 2007 after an 11 year interval. Changes can be seen in the trees themselves, the surrounding vegetation and my aging hand. Changes are a way to measure time. I'm continuing this each year with an 11 year interval after the first black and white photograph, hopefully until 2026, when I'll redo the ones from 2015. Some of the original trees have been lost in hurricanes and other windstorms. In those instances, I photograph my hand in the empty spaces where the trees used to be. I have three infrared trail cameras installed beside the Blast Hole Pond River. So there's one there and there's the other one there. And that's the river. These cameras are triggered by the movement of wildlife. I didn't crop this photograph. It's just what the camera captured when the moose entered its detection zone. In the final works, I'm pairing two events. One is the movement of wildlife at ground level crossing the river, and the other is celestial bodies overhead presented as a line of text. These are just two of the countless natural phenomena that occurred at the same time. I'm calling this series, What Came to Light at Blast Hole Pond River? But another title could be heaven and earth. I love how serendipitous, unintentional, and off-centered these photographs are. They're not like conventional wildlife photographs. Uh, with this one, it was raining and the flash caught the raindrops. In, a, in any case, the moose would never let anyone get this close. This is the legs of two moose standing on the frozen river. And this is a silver fox walking along the edge of the river. And one last one, a snowshoe hare crossing a snow bridge over the river. This is some work from my most recent series titled Between the Earth and the Firmament. It's a series of 10 assemblages I did through the four seasons in 2020. I spread long sheets of paper outside in different places, including on the snow in the winter. Then I laid down on the paper and did a rubbing with charcoal around my body. Wherever I lie down outside, I'm in what's known as the boundary layer. This is the thin layer of air between the surface of the ground and the atmosphere. The drawings could be seen as a simple measurement of my humanness in relationship to this terrain. The photograph on the left is of the place where I laid down and did the charcoal rubbing. And I took the photo on the right, looking straight up as I was lying in place. The handwritten texts under the photographs are from my field notes. They're some of the things I observed, but most of what exists is imperceptible to the human eye, including the wind, sounds, and smells. So I included some of these phenomena in the notes. I'll show you the three assemblages I did with the river. On shadows of spruce, and over 13 feet of snowfall so far, covering a spot on the Blast Hole Pond River where moose have crossed. The lists of what I'm lying on are in order of what's closest to my body than going downwards. And for what I'm lying under, 
The order is what's closest to my body, going upwards. Under sunlight, a faffering northwest wind, branches of a dead spruce covered in lichen, two tall spruce and clouds. On grasses, mosses, lichens, three tiny spruce trees, two tiny birch, one tiny mountain maple, all growing on a boulder in the Blast Hole Pond River. Under a dragonfly, branches of balsam fir and mountain maple, veering breezes with the waning crescent moon. And the third one, On blueberry bushes, bunchberry leaves, mosses and lichens on the bedrock of the Blast Hole Pond River. Under spruce and mountain maple, a dead birch, strong winds from the southwest and smoky haze from thousands of lightning sparked wildfires on the other side of the continent. There were over 11,000 wildfires in California in the summer of 2020, and the smoke traveled right across the North American continent to Newfoundland and beyond. Just gonna take a sip before I start this. So this is, a, this is my conclusion. It's a spoken word poem I wrote called Ways of Walking. It's a list poem composed just of verbs, referring to different kinds of movement. Some of the words are from the local Newfoundland dialect. It's also a sound poem, so you can just let the words wash over you. I composed it so the sound of one word would roll into the next one. And I've made a montage of images to show you as I read the poem. Step, stride, stroll, squoil, lope, roam, patrol, slow, stall, stall, stall. Amble, ramble, scramble, shamble, dawdle, waddle, wobble, toddle, hobble, hop, hike, idle, idle, idle. Bound, bolt, mosey, meander, wander, saunter, totter, loiter, loiter, loiter. Streel, steve, veer, creep, crawl, marl, follow, falter, halt. Trudge, tread, trapes, pace. Prance, prowl, scrawl, romp, dodge, pause, pause, pause. Vamp, tramp, parade, stampede, plod, slog, jog, lollygag, zigzag, gallivant, dilly dally, 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 dally. Sleepwalk, stumble, stomp, strut. Scuttle, scur, scroop, stagger, swagger, sachet, stray, sprint, slither, slinge, <coughs> slink, skip, limp, linger. Drift, trip, trot, slog, waltz, wait. Wait, wait. Run, rush, shuffle, lumber. Gallop, 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 dash, scamper, canter, skitter, scurry, hurry, hover, hover, hover. Wind, trek, tread, trample, clamber, tiptoe, track, 
stand, turn, return. Is everything well? Are you done? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. What a lovely presentation. Really beautiful words. Thank you. We Thanks. Do have, we do have some time for anyone who has any questions from the floor. And the way we do this, Marlene, is that um, that the people in Studio Three might want to uh, let our steward know their question. He will type it into chat. So um, we'll just wait here and see if there's anything and if there are no questions um Eamon, could you let, let us know that too <laughs> so i'll sit here patiently and watch I'll look at out of your window, the beautiful setting that you have for us there. What time of day is it at the moment? Uh, it's noon. Well, 12, 12.15. Yeah. Great. Uh, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> So Claire has said, wait, 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 wait has been an important message for me. Very nice. Very <laughs> <It's> nice comment. <laughs> How long did I wait? Um, oh, well, I do a lot of waiting beside that river as well as in, in the forest. Um, I wouldn't be able to put a length of time on it. <laughs> Are there any other questions? So the question from the room, could you speak more about space and time, please, Marlene? Ah, well, I did say uh, when I was showing the images of my hand on the trees that changes are a way to measure time. And as you've noticed, I, I, I love the seasons here. They're so extreme. And we, ha we definitely have four distinct seasons here. Uh, well, everywhere in Canada, for sure, um, and, and especially here in Newfoundland. Um, space. Uh, ooh. I mean, I do experience this place with my whole body. And so my work is at that scale, um, the scale of my body in this landscape. So my sense of space is in relationship to that, those proportions. And um, I realize that I don't experience individual leaves on trees or individual spruce or fir needles as I would if I was an insect. I experience at the scale of wildflowers and trees, uh, not blades of grass. So there's also that sense of proportion too. Great, thank you. What an interesting answer to an interesting question. Thank you very much. Is there anything else from the floor in Studio 3? Somebody, Marlene, you, you, you won't know this, but somebody just ran up the stairs to find me here in the studio to, be able to, to make sure that I got that question for you about space and time. <laughs> so we'll see whether we find anyone run up the stairs yet. So anything else, Eamon?
think that that might be, I think that might be it. Oh, no, there is. Ah. The emotional impact of the missing tree. Oh, ah, now you're asking something. Yes, a lot, because of course I knew that tree. Um, there's been three hurricanes in the last 20 years since, since I moved here. And in each case, um, I've lost a lot of trees. I mean, I do use them then for firewood to heat the house in the winter. So there is a nice cycle involved, but um, yeah, I, I almost like once I stay in the house during the hurricane, it's too dangerous to go outside because there are trees falling, but once it's subsided, I go out and I, I size up what's, what's happened. And when I see one of the trees down, I, I, I wrote a poem about this and, and I said, I sense their silent cries. I do. So there definitely is an emotional, um, emotional loss. Yeah. I, I find that with living this, with this much nature around me, I really have to get used to a lot of loss. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is there anything else from the floor? Well, from the, from the people watching online, we've got some participants watching online as well. These have been great questions. Thank you. It's given me a chance to add a little more to what I said. It was beautiful, the room says. <laughs> Lots of exclamation marks. So thank you so much for your time and thank you for joining us here in Dartington. It's a shame that we have, we're not seeing you in person, but lovely to, that you're beaming in to us and bringing your view into our space in Dartington with you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kat. In which case...
So, hello, my name is Dr. Helen Villinghurst, and my name is Dr. Morgan. I'm going to talk to you today about the inception of our two research trails. And I'm just going to get some uh, cyber technology, so the work. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's what makes me a doctor. Okay. Um, yeah, so in recent years I've been walking, exploring, and making artworks in response to the River Earn that runs from its source on Dartmoor through the South Hands and out to the sea as one on Estuary. And my area of walking and exploration runs out of Plymouth to the northeast and covers a large area of china clay and tungsten extraction. Our research trajectories intersect quite literally and geographically at the tiny village of Harford, which is about 14 miles west of where we are now. My grandparents built a house near the banks of this river in the 1960s in a village called Irvington. I've only fragmented memories from this time, mostly standing in this river, building dams with my older brother, trying to catch minnows. Irvington is mentioned in the Doomsday Book from the 1080s, situated in the hundred of Alariga, a parish or district now lost. The salt pan on the estuary is mentioned in the Doomsday Book, a quite small salt pan, rendered 13 pounds and 10 shillings. Raised in a safe in 1080, which is currently about £10,000. Yes, salt production or extraction from this site goes back to the Bronze Age. Much further upstream and still on the River Earn is the village of Harford, which was also once in the lost hundred of Arariga. There is been called Earn, Ellen, Willem, and Aramis over time. This river can source the sea. Is central to my current research practice, which is drawn heavily upon the essay Hydrofeminism by Estrella Nevanis, especially her work on ecotones, the unique ecologies created by the meeting and overlapping of other distinct ecologies. Much has been extracted from in or near this river over the centuries, tin being central to the story of the entire region from pre Roman times right up to the 1930s. Leaving the open wall, the river passes under its first road bridge. Less than 200 metres from this bridge is a cave. Helen and I have imagined this as a wolf slayer, and perhaps this is where our research trajectories truly meet. The course of the river above Harvard is not natural, it's been created by the tin mining industry on the whole, and begs the question is there such a thing as a wild river? And also the question, how do you rewind the river? Perhaps some of the answers involve a mixing or a merging, uh, making shifts occur as self and river go forward. From the very start, walls jump forward to become the lens through which I would critique this territory. A Dartmoor moorland just south of the protection of the official bounds of the National Park. When I made my first walks up there around 2006, an old lane shaded by ash trees ran along the top of the hill to a small woodland called Hemmerden Bar. It was a mournful place. Perhaps because the road from the city to Hemmerden is called Wolverwood Road and passes by Wolverwood Farm. Or perhaps it was the thick, dark fringes of woodland I walked through. But whenever I walked there, I was spooked by the idea of wolves watching me from the shadows. Of course, I knew that British wolves have long been extinct in the UK. Literary academic Sam George writes of how, and I quote, the eradication of the British wolf is largely due to the campaigns of English monarchs. King Edgar, who reigned from 959 to 975, was the first monarch to set about cleansing and ridding the country of these ravenous creatures. 
Edgar demanded that his Welsh subjects pay him 300 wolf skins a year. Some criminals were encouraged to pay their debts in wolf tongues. As a lone woman walking in the UK, my unease would invariably cause me to ruminate on the old folktale of Little Red Riding Hood. Today, British children are told how a heroic woodcutter or huntsman finishes off the big bad wolf and saves Red Riding Hood. But the story has not always gone this way. In Charles Perrault's version, written in 1697, the wolf gobbles up Red Riding Hood, and that is the end of that. Apart from a final note of caution to young ladies to beware of men behaving like wolves. However, when I walked around Hemmerden Mine, it was not predatory men stalking me, but the absent presences. We may call them ghosts or hauntings of wolves. As an artist whose process begins with walking, I have learned to attend to dread daydreams and gut feelings. Intuitions can be the body's way of telling me, there is more here, look again. In 2014, I returned to the site and was shocked to find the old lane gone. The top of the hill had been quarried away, local houses abandoned, excavations for tungsten had begun by a company called Wolf Minerals. The element Wolfram, sorry, the element name Wolfram came from the name of the ore Wolframite, which derives from German Wolfsram, which means wolf's foam. It got this name because European tin smelters noticed that the presence of wolframite in tin ore reduced the tin yield, appearing to eat tin like a wolf would devour sheep. In 1779, Irish chemist min and min mineralogist Peter Wolf deduced the potential for a new element, tungsten, to be extracted from the mineral wolframite. Peter Wolf was one of the last alchemists. In later life, he exhibited increasingly strange behavior that was almost certainly dementia from prolonged exposure to heavy metals. His curious eccentricities included breakfasting at 4 a.m., often inviting a few close friends who could only gain entry to his room by tapping out a secret code. Extractions continue to occur on Darmore. We've been trying to think through ways to resist extractivisms, thinking through stories that demonstrate what is visible by its absence, stories that fall around being or becoming over having. There are many water stories relating to rivers, their diversions and their extractions. On Darmore, there are countless leaks, gently flowing human made channels of water that rely on gravity to move this resource from its point of extraction from a natural water course to its destination. ASLE, which is my way of saying the Association of the Study of Literature and the Environment, recently asked, what is to be gained, reimagined, and sifted through by alluvial thinking? In hydrographic terms, watersheds are stretches of land that divide bodies of water from others. Watersheds congregate and build, obviate political boundaries, blur lines between the terrestrial and the aquatic, fresh and salt. They seep and produce, they teem and transform. Temporality in the watershed is also messy. Time sink, sediment and circulate as the past mingles with the present. In the 11th century, the sentence of exile of being outlawed was codified in English law with the decree caput gelit lupinum, Latin for let this, let his be a wolf's head, that is, let him be free to be attacked, severed, and killed. However, as women were always and already outside of the law, they were automatically considered to reasonably share the outlaw's expectation of attack, because to do so 
was not unlawful. History demonstrates that the legal permission to dam women and dam rivers has been to the detriment of both. So wolf and woman could now reconsider their animality as an asset, inhabiting an economic existence, a threshold of distinction and of passage, making our haunting by extinct wolves feel important and appropriate, blurring distinctions between hunter and hunted, human and animal, an ecotonic shift occurred. <laughs> Some years ago, I went to have some poachers, or lampers, as they described themselves. Upon my return, I tried to capture the contradictory feelings, and this is what I wrote. I have thunder. I want lightning. I want to be in my earth in the forest, smelling the weather, dashed in the scent of the storm that seeks out this cleft of land. Soiled feet and button eyes, premonition and adrenaline, fueling at my every move. I have been blooded, and now I understand my prey. I've come to feel, fill the space I feel I occupy at last. Shortly after the quarry, the hill, near where the old lady had been, I heard the howling of a pack of five wolves enclosed in the nearby zoo from across the valley. And since then, I have repeatedly visited, documented, and made artwork in response to the area around Harford. And much of this work references wolves and werewolves. Sam George sees an aesthetic shift towards haunted landscapes, folk horror, the weird, and the eerie by many British artists as a response to this time of an environmental crisis, unprecedented building development and loss of habitats in the UK. She writes, clearly the recent rise of the Erie coincides with the, this era of late capitalism and a phase of severe environmental damage. In England, this has not taken the form of sudden catastrophe, but rather a slow grinding away of species such as the native wolf. The result, a landscape constituted more actively by what is missing than what is present. This aesthetic shift towards the weird and the eerie is also acknowledged by landscape writer Robert McFarlane, who describes a mutated cult cultural terrain that includes the weird and the punk, as well as the attentive and the devotional. Among the shared land landmarks of this terrain are ruins, fields, pits, fringes, relics, buried objects, hilltops, falcons, demons, and deep pasts. In much of this work, suppressed forces pulse and flicker beneath the ground and within the air. Capital, oil, energy, violence, state power, surveillance, waiting to erupt or to condense. Our area of mutual wolf hauntings and river wanderings is a zone of historic ongoing and accelerating ecological devastation, from China clay, tin, and now tungsten mining. And Dartmoor is also one of the last British habitats of wild wolves. Eric Hemery describes how the last wolves in Devon are said to have been killed in the woods around Drews, Painton and Briggs in the early 1780s, and how Creeper Pound, a stone sheepfold on Dartmoor, was made to keep the wolves out. The church windows at Harford depict Christ with St. Hubert on one side and St. Petrock on the other. Both saints are associated with hunting and with wolves. They are said to have interceded in the hunt and to be protectors of animals and voted to animal rights activists, but also to the hunter. A white wolf guarded Petrock's sheepskin and staff for seven years and remained by his side when Petrock returned to Britain from a pilgrimage abroad. St. Hubert, on the other hand, is a patron saint of huntsmen, woodsmen, metal workers, and werewolves. Both saints appear equally to represent hunter, hunted, and hunting ground. 
St. Hubert's keys were amulets handed out by monks from St. Hubert's Abbey in Liège to protect from rabies. These keys were often hung on the walls of houses for protection, and they were also heated until they were red hot and then placed directly on the body where the, where the bite occurred. Another treatment, an operation known as cutting, was applied by priests, making a tiny incision on the person's forehead. They would insert a thread said to have been taken from St. Hubert's soul. The forehead was then bound with a black bandage for nine days. So where are the actual walls with flesh and blood bodies within this mix? To remind ourselves there are more to rules than hauntings, legends and folk tales. Helen and I, perhaps are against our better judgment, visited the Christmas zoo nights at Dartmoor Zoo, close to Hemerton and Harford, to see some real embodied wolves. Accompanied by commercial Christmas songs, we made our way past animal cages, plastic elves and Santa's grotto. Children and parents shrieked, shining their flashlights into the blinking eyes of the animal exhibits in their enclosures. We waited silently beside the floodlit wolf enclosure, aware that wolves were watching us from the shadows. Eventually our patience paid off and as a solitary wolf loped by a haunch of raw meat in its jaws, but for the chain, um, we, he was so close we could have touched him, but for the chain and fence between us. We came away convinced that the wolf without a territory is as tragic and as haunting as the territory that has lost its wolf. As is traditional, this tale ends on a cautionary note. To be aware that the stories and images of living wolves, rivers, and other non-human persons can be, and often are, appropriated by those who do not have the welfare of wolves, rivers, or their ecosystems at the heart of what they do. Multinational corporations, are cynically aware of the commercial persuasive potential of deploying images of the wild world and weaving animal tales for commercial or political purposes. Performance scholar and animal, animal rights activist Una Chowdhury suggests that we need to find ways to talk about actual animals now, whilst re resisting temptations to view animals as symbols for human ideas and metaphors for human dramas. Wolves do not need to stand for human tropes and traits. In her essay, The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction, Ursula Le Guin proposes story as a net bag, a sling, a sack, a bottle, a box, a container, a holder, a recipient, for holding things, in particular, powerful relation to one another, and to us. We have come from a territory that has lost its wolves, carrying a riding hood basket of tales to suggest it is time to tell less human-centric and extracted stories. We have seen how the story can be, like the ecotone and the river itself, a conflagration of elements, an assemblage of becomings, wolf, woman, little girl, Granny, woodsman, woodland, saint, demon, ghost. Stories can be told differently with different endings for different times. In Bodies of Water, the book, Neymanis speculates about our capacity to remain connected in a way that is complementary to Ursula Le Guin's carrier bag theory of fiction, whilst also paying close attention so that which differentiates us. Oof. Exceeding the intentions of Le Guin's assertion that the things in the bag exist in a specific and compelling relation to each other, Nemanis posits the possibility that we ourselves are evolutionary containers, holding within our bodily waters the potential for the other, which she calls diffractive relationality. This process of diffraction hinges upon difference. 
where each ripple varies and exhibits nuance. Difference between species is equally nuanced, with no spirit experience or articulation of embodiment being a universal experience. Perhaps in the process of walking the wolf flow terrains of our collaborative practice, we are holding within our bodies invisible sediments of collective memory pertaining to the wolf river woman matrix. And through our practice, stories that demonstrate what has been made invisible by its absence can surface and become reimagined. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. I just I just wondered how you would change from research. I don't think it's we really know that because it's quite a, a feels like quite a new collaboration. Um and it's been I think very much sort of side by side, not really doing much yet. We've done small things together, a lot, of, a lot of walks together, and we've made a journey abroad together now, and, and this is the first piece of art we've made together, yes. as I would say. Yes. So, um, I, we'll find out, I guess. Yes, and I suppose I would add to that by saying that um, my own practice is marked this year by various collaborations, and this is one of them and how I'm beginning to reflect on what it means to collaborate. And so, and I don't know what, where those reflections will take me, but there certainly will be some change, I'm sure. We would say, talking just as we were coming in, as we always put um, about how we put this thing together, um, but actually what we hadn't intended, but what it's turned out to be is a, uh, performance about collaboration as much as anything mm -hmm. else. So that's the kind of that's the work having its own thing that's going to give to us that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I felt involved in that collaboration with the things that we have. Mm -hmm. it's just one thing. Um, uh, uh, yes, it's in terms of not coming before, but I. But I am a keen, keen collaborator, and the idea that collaboration allows the movie in between that, and because I can I can see, you know, that's, am I right thinking that you see collaboration in this way of contracting? Is, am, I, am I using that in the right way? Yeah. Hmm, I don't know if there is a right way. I think there are lots of different right ways, maybe. Um, and I think, you know, the, the concept of diffraction that you, shared with us earlier is slightly different from the one that I've shared here at uh, Street in the Marmots. Um, and, and maybe also that's the point. Perhaps these, these are definitions of diffraction are diffracted by definition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was just thinking with the idea of writing, the more people collaborate, the more you can't you know, you know, you, you go in all different directions. I think that was one of the ideas for us about bringing all materials in because um, we're re both of us in our practices in different ways are really aware of the, the flows of stuff and, and stuff affecting us. And it's quite easy when we come into the studio to, to forget about the stuff we pick up and the stuff that comes meaningful is, you know, I mean, in terms of materials for me as an artist, there's certain materials I go back to um, and, and we're both water workers. <laughs> yes, for me it's, it's very much water and this really is water from the river that I collected at the weekend um, in a bottle that had been discarded on the banks of the urn. And so that materiality is, is not just about um, well, it has to include the, the things that make us uncomfortable, including plastic waste, for instance, and, and speak uh, and to negate, you know, to pretend that doesn't exist, is to only tell half the story. 
And I think those, those are just as much our collaborators mm -hmm. as, um, you know, the young humans in our practices. I mean, we both do a lot of walking and like to be out out there in within the landscape. So, um, you know, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we all lose into the bigger, the biggest players. I, I was slightly drifting off with the words, but I was very engaged with the, with the objects and the materials and the patterns and the shapes that were going on. So it's rich. That's interesting. You should talk about patterns and shapes because I, one of the things that I work with a lot in different ways is, is diagrams and so it's kind of interesting. Okay, that's interesting. That's, and the that's patterns great. on this cake, I don't know if any of you can see them in the light. It's a uh, braille wood um, and the braille is the uh, is a paragraph from hydrogenism of the essay that pertains to ecozones. So we're kind of saturated with patterns. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, in terms of feedback or any thoughts or reflections, um, it'd be really, I'd be, you know, really interested to hear over a longer period if people, you know, even if it's a month or two months, um, just to hear feedback really, really valuable to both of us. I, think. I really enjoyed the, the nature of the storytelling, um, you know, of the past and the complexities and um, and also the critical thinking that went into the questions that were asked, along with you know, I mean, it was just very beautifully put together. Thank you. Um, I'm really sorry to bring things to a close. I'm shooting the session at five o'clock, and we need to rearrange the room for the panel. And I think everybody might like a bit of fresh air. Yeah. Thank you very much.